broken. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> now the batteries are broken. Oh, we just replaced these batteries. Well, you talk too hot. That's a good point. <laughs> These are the finest discount batteries you can get from China. Yeah. For there is no respect of persons of God. 
For as many have sinned without law shall also perish without law. As many have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing, or else excusing one another, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whoever thou art that judges. For when thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou judgest, that judges doeth the same things. Now the same things are the 23 things listed at the end of chapter 1. Okay? Mm -hmm. 23 is the number of death in the Bible. Paul lists 29, 23 things there. He can add them up. That the, 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 the result, or that knowing the judgment of God, verse 32, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So he's laid out the issue. This is, this is how the heathen got that way. Paul talked about that, right? And the, they rejected God. So God just gave them up. God just gave them up over here. He's dealing with this. He gave the Gentiles up. He didn't give them up because of their sin. Be careful on that passage. He gave them up to their sin. Because they rejected him. Okay? You like to read. You to read that there. He gave them up to their sin. You guys want to go live that lascivious way? You want to live in that religion that mm -hmm. Paul was talking about? Have at it. I've got my religion and my, in my country, in my nation that I'm going to deal with. Do those things all result in death? Not only do you like doing them, but you love to have other people doing them with you. And isn't that the truth? We sin, we may feel a little bit bad, but if we get a lot of people sin with us, it must be okay. Sin is dangerous that way. It will fool you. So now I've been talking about the guy that says, okay, I, I get that. But I'm not that bad. I'm better than Paul. I mean, that's clear. But, <laughs> but I'm glad I'm not as bad as he is. Because he's got a problem. He does 11 of those things. I only do six. <coughs> that's what he's talking. He says, you know, you do, you, you, you do the same things. Maybe they're not the same thing. But the same thing is they're still sin. What's the best definition of sin? You ever think about that? Hey, how would you define sin? Look at what Romans 3. Verse 23. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's your definition, definition of sin. Falling short of the glory of God. What's his glory? Go back and read the issues with Moses. It's all of his attributes. It's his name. His justice. His love. His forbearance. His long suffering. All the characteristics of God that never violate another characteristic of God. In one thing, God has chosen to, Paul talked about this, to his glory is represented, by the way, in the colors of the rainbow. But the sin is simply to fall short of the glory of God. Verse 2, back in, in Romans 2, Paul says, For sure that the judgment of God is according to the truth against them which commit such things. We are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth. When God looks out and he, his judgment comes down, it's based on truth. It's not based on a respect of a person. That person had a rough day, a, a rough go of it. We're not going to look the other way. This person's rich, so he gets the benefit of the doubt. Or maybe it's the other. This person's poor, so they get the benefit of the doubt. Today, he doesn't say, well, this person's a Jew. Yeah, that's actually going to make the point. He never said that. Just because they were a Jew, even if they were under the law program, the law was going to be their judgment. It's based on truth. 
Come with me to Luke 18. We get Luke 18 and Job 9. You know, I'm sorry, but I think that thing is going to be a problem. It's actually creating a focus issue on this yeah. one because it's out of focus. I'm going to start twitching here in a minute. Steve's <laughs> <laughs> one of the disclaimers I can put on video games. <laughs> oh, what did I say? Job 9 and Luke 18. Luke 18, verse 9. Luke 18, verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Oh, yeah, that's what we're talking about there in Romans 2. Two men went up in the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not as other men are, extortioners and just, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. What I want you to see there is that judgment. That public, that, 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 the Pharisee, that, that, that the self-righteous guy, he's just so like he's not as bad as the other guy. You know what that looks like today? That person can't be saved because look at how they live their life. If they were truly saved, they wouldn't do that. Because mm -hmm. I stopped doing that when I got saved. Now, we're not, if you're saved, you're not in jeopardy of the judgment. But that's how subtle this can be. Yeah. It's very subtle. It's a warning. Look over at Job 9. You know, you probably don't need this verse. I think, uh, by looking around this room with a few exceptions, I think we all have enough life experience to know how true this verse is. Look at 9 verse 1 of Job. If I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. And if I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. And isn't that the worst? The issue is not making ourselves, comparing ourselves to the other person. Because you know what? We all come short of the glory of God. And Jesus died for everybody. I'm not talking about universal reconciliation. It's available to everybody. Jesus died for the sins of everybody, even if they're worse than me. Look over at Genesis 18. One of the great questions of all time. It's interesting that as I look at the scripture and I see the people that came face to face with God in the scriptures, I would like to think that if, be careful because this isn't going to happen, okay? But if God were to appear right there and tell me to do something, I would just be yes or no, sir. Everybody that I can think of that came across God in the Bible argues with him. <laughs> I think there's something about being in the presence of God that's comforting. It's interesting. Here, Abraham, he's got one more thing to say. You know, he's negotiating with God about what's going to happen down there in Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at verse 25. This be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Here's the question. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Paul answers that. He says the judgment is according to truth. Come with me to Psalm 9. Psalm 9 and verse 7. But the Lord shall 
shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. That judgment is according to truth. It is according to righteousness. Mm -hmm. If I can say, it's not the adversarial system we use in America. <laughs> Truth is, the, the, the question Pilate asked, what is truth? I mean, because I'm such a righteous guy, I love to watch true crime on what I'm streaming. And inevitably, it comes down to the lawyer saying, oh, I don't care what the truth is, I'm going to define the truth. The judge and the jury, no, they'll believe whatever I tell them if I can. That's not the way God operates. Righteousness. Truth without respect of people. Look over to Psalm 96. Revelation 15, verse 4. Who shall, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. He's coming to judge, and he's going to judge the truth and righteousness. Now notice we talked about his judgment in time past. In the butt down and in the ages to come. <coughs> that judgment is coming. And you have an opportunity to long start your forbearance of God to avoid that today. But the judgment's coming. It's promised and it will be delivered. We read in Romans 1 that God's wrath is revealed today. Now it doesn't say poured out. It says it's revealed today. And it's revealed in Paul's gospel. That's where we find the manifestation of that today. Look back at Romans 2, verse 3. Sorry for you. 
And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? There's the arrogance of man right there. Who is he to judge me? You know what that looks like today? How could a loving God allow fill in the blank to happen? Yeah. What that is saying is, if God were as righteous as I am, he wouldn't allow that to happen. That's right. It's the arrogance of man right there. And man thinks he's going to avoid that judgment. We'll see it in, we'll see it in, a, in a minute. That man actually knows better than that. Because man wants to rely on what? His ability. Our ability to perform, to do something, to prove that we're not as bad as we think we are. Just thinking of an album where I haven't thought about it long enough to think, nah, it's probably never going to be so. <laughs> And it'll probably slip out before the days now. Verse 4, Or despise us out of the of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Man, that's a good one. <laughs> despise us out of the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering. Is that not what the world does today? Today is a time where the riches of his goodness and his forbearance and his long suffering are on display. Time magazine back in the 70s, that was the prompt I was supposed to bring around when I did it today. Ran a title. God is dead. They deny. The forbearance and the long suffering and the riches of his goodness. You know what they want? They want the Old Testament judgments to come down. Show me that you're God. Yeah. Man, don't do that. That's not what we want to see. Not the way that we want. The riches of his goodness. And I just I love that phrase. But this is a time in which we live that God is forbearing with the world, is long suffering with the world. Forbearance, the exercise of patience. Of course, the world doesn't think they need patience from God today. And long suffering, he's suffering with us. Long suffering. John Verstegen, if you've ever heard him say that word, I can't do it like he does, it's long, so, and John's long for hours now. That's what God's doing today. And you know what? That goodness, that goodness of God, it should bring a person to repentance. It should bring a person, after reading Romans 1, we're only in Romans 2 now. And Paul says, based on what we've written so far, one chapter, you, sh you should understand his goodness, his forbearance, and his long suffering. And that goodness of God should lead a person to repentance. It mm -hmm. should be, thank God you're not condemning me for my sin. Mm -hmm. No, it's God is dead. If you were as righteous as I am, he doesn't even exist. Now, can I tell you, Christianity's answer to that came 30 years later. In a publication put out by Christianity Today. It took 30 years for a response to come. They duplicated the cover of Time magazine. It said, God is not dead. Yet. <clears throat> Make all the judgments you want about that periodical one. I probably agree with you. But isn't that something? 30 years later, the response is, God is not dead. Yet. It should lead to repentance. Look at 1 Timothy 1.
you know, if we could get a do-over, could we get rid of, other than the fact that I was born here at the time, could we, could we get rid of like 65 to 73? Think of all the bad stuff that happened between 63 and 73. I was born, that was a good thing. <laughs> 1 Timothy 1, verse 16. Now, verse 14. The grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. You should accept what he's about to say without qualification. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Why did Jesus come into the world? Did you think about that? Did he come to be a good example? <laughs> Did he come to be a good teacher? He came to save sinners. And you know, Paul's not the only guy that says that. John says the same thing. We were talking about that already. Mm -hmm. You see the judgment of the world, which is what's going on here. Well, Jesus, if he even existed, he was a great teacher. This verse tells you why Jesus came to the world to save sinners. Now, how many have sinned? All have sinned in what? All are short of the glory of God. <coughs> Paul's the chief of sinners. He's leading, leading the wagon. How be it for this cause? I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them that should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. I proved about an hour and a half ago I can go too long, so I'm going to do this quick. <laughs> Jesus said, blessing the Son, forgiveness. Blessing the Holy Spirit, no forgiveness. I'm paraphrasing that, okay? Why? Because there's no more, there's, there's no more redemption. There's a man sent from God, his name was John, John the Baptist. Herod kills him, Israel goes, eh, whatever. Israel killed their own Messiah. Okay? And then the whole... Stephen told the Holy Spirit, they stoned him. The young man standing there, consenting to his death, holding the coast. That young man's name was Saul, who we know as the Apostle Paul. Okay? He was unforgivable at that moment. That's, that's, him, that's unpardonable sin, as so-called, as, as they say. Okay, I thought I had committed this unpardonable sin. I went out of that Rockaway conference with tears running down my eyes because I knew, understood grace by faith. I knew I'd lost my salvation by blasphemy the Holy Spirit. And I didn't know what to do, and I couldn't talk to Richard or John about it because they kicked me out. <laughs> it's a terrible place to be, just quite frankly. Now, the blasphemy, you can blaspheme the Holy Spirit in that you can speak bad things about the Holy Spirit, but that is not the unpardonable sin. That's when the nation felt, but more for what I'm talking about now, Paul blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. There was no more forgiveness of sins for him. He was not possible to be saved. Mm -hmm. So when he says that in me first might show forth all long suffering, there's the example. If Paul can be saved, you and I can be saved. I had a contractor in my house when we were building our house, and I was studying, and he goes, did you really believe that? No, I'm just wasting my time in front of you because I got to know what you have. Yeah, I believe it. And, and so I said, I, I go, hey, you know, can I share some things with you? He said, no. I said, okay. I said, if you'd said yes, can I tell you what I would have said? Yeah, that'd be fine. <laughs> okay. So I shared the gospel with him. He said, I, and his answer was, Dave, I've had people tell me that before, and I am so bad, not even God can save me. <laughs> now that breaks my heart. And I never could get through that wall. But the, the answer to that is, Paul. Mm -hmm. Because Paul was not saved. God concluded him in ignorance. God reached down in time, saved him, brought him a new program, the dispensation of grace, characterized by grace and peace, time of long suffering, forbearance, of which Paul is our example. Goes on to talk about the pattern. Paul's not the pattern, grace is the pattern. Paul's where you see it expressed. Okay? Paul was our pattern, but in the context here, the issue is that me, first, Christ Jesus might Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern. To them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. The pattern is grace. Paul got saved by grace. Mm -hmm. 
Put his faith in what Jesus told him to do. He says, anybody will believe that for me from here on. God promises to save them too. Keep him out of this judgment. The fact that God's not imputing sin to the world today should lead a person to that repentance. But we're so smart that we say, as Sir Robert Anderson called it in his wonderful book you should read called The Silence of the Heavens, the world looks at the silence of the heavens right now and says, hey, again, don't need it. Doesn't even exist. I'm going to be fine because I'm a good person. I don't care if you watch CNN or Fox or MSNBC. They will all tell you the same thing. If you're a good person, you will get to heaven. One of them, a guy I really respected, said, when he was being interviewed by Bill Maher, of course I don't believe there was a flood. Only a fool would believe there's a flood. And I'm good enough to get to heaven. You guys know who uh, Ben Shapiro is? Yeah. <laughs> if you can find it, it's good entertainment. Ben Shapiro, who's a practicing Jew, he actually says he tries to do all, all 635 laws that there are. Mm -hmm. He and a Catholic priest sat down to discuss how you get saved. That's good entertainment. Mm -hmm. Get yourself a buck of popcorn and your. Because your... <laughs> neither one of them got a clue. <laughs> Neither one of them has a clue. They went on for 45 minutes. This guy I respect, but he's lost. He's determined and he knows better. I don't know really what that had to do with anything. Paul is our example. Come with me to Romans 4 and Ephesians 2. <laughs> See, sometimes these things pop up like that. I should not say. Ephesians 4, verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of death. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. See, that guy that says he's better than anybody, he says, my works, are, my works are enough. Because compared to that guy, I'm doing great. I may be not as good as that guy, but I'm getting there. If you want to stand, which will be at that time, before the great white throne judgment on based on your own works, let me know how that works out. Or you can stand before the judgment seat of Christ based on who you become in Christ. One's an issue of eternal damnation, which is real, and people will go there forever. Or the judgment seat of Christ is an issue of reward. Which one would you rather have? Would you rather stand before somebody and get reward or get judged? Look at Ephesians 2, verse 4 and 5. You know this verse. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. It's God's grace that saves you. When you believe what he says, you should believe. It's always been the issue. That's what they do. Responding to God according to how God tells you to respond. Okay? Don't build a boat right now. It's not going to save you. It saves you. Hey guys, hey people. But it's not going to save you today. Go back to Romans 2. I just think that talk was too fast. <laughs> I don't think I took a talk as long as I did this afternoon. I really don't. I, I want to read the other. Verse 5. That after thy hardness and a penitent heart, treasure us up in thy 
of wrath, against the day of wrath, and the revelation of the, what kind of judgment? Righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patience, that to them who by patience continue to will and seek for glory and honor life and immortality, eternal life. Unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey in righteousness, indignation, and wrath. That word impenitent, not repenting of sin, not contrite. What's the world say? This is kind of long suffering or forbearance today. The guy with the judgment, self-righteous guy says, hey, it's okay, I'm going to get to heaven. If there even is such a thing, I'm going to be okay, I'm a good person, my heart's in the right spot, you know. It's going to be okay. It'll all work out. You know what that person's doing? He's treading. Think about the words Paul uses. Yeah. Treasuring up to himself wrath against the day of wrath. There are things in my life, when I talk worldly humanly, that are a great treasure to me. My family, of course, but now that my kids are gone. <laughs> the things that I treasure right now have to do with my motorhome, the trips I take when I get to take in that motorhome. And we do all these things, and we, and we do love these things. And you know, we have a little place, and then we go here, we get this, and we got, you know, you've seen it, we got a map, and we got 29 states on the map, because we've been to that with the motorhome, trying to figure out the motorhome to Hawaii. And we treasure that little map. And we, got, we actually drive to a stake just so we need to stick. And we treasure that thing. It's important to us, right? It's silly. We get it. It's important to us. That's what, you're, that's what he's talking about. They're treasuring up wrath. The stuff that they're treasuring up, they like. That sin is awesome. Go back and read the end of chapter 1. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but what? Have pleasure in them to do them. They treasure those things. People ask me all the time, why don't you have people give personal testimonies a lot? Because I have found, in, when I do it even sometimes, people will recount the sin that they've given up to Christ, and you, the sin become, just recounting the sin becomes something they treasure. Sin's there for a season, and that's basically sin because it makes our flesh feel good. They reject the gospel and they're treasuring up wrath. The stuff that results in wrath, they know it does and they love it and they treasure it. It's important to them. And they're going to get out here and it might be human good. It doesn't have to be evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Human good, human evil. God doesn't want either. They might come out here with all the stuff that they treasure and say, look what I did. And Jesus is going to say, look what I did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what's going to happen? They're treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath. This is the day of wrath he's talking about. That great white throne judgment. I'll be clear. This is the great white throne judgment. It's bad. This is the judgment seat of Christ. It's good. If I get it mixed up, you know what I mean. <laughs> I talk too fast with them. Okay? They're treasuring up that wrath. And they're going to go in and they're going to be so proud of that. And it's just going to be nothing. I think about some guys. <coughs> two guys that have changed the world that have died in the last three or four years. Steve Jobs and uh, Paul Allen. Undeniably changed the world. When was the last time you thought about either one? All the money they have. And you know what? I don't, I don't know if they were saved or not. If they're not, all that stuff they built up the treasure here, doesn't matter. I brought in the internet age. Excuse me, but one trumps the other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hate it when those get real. Not real, but everybody thinks something else. <laughs> God is forbearing. He's not imputing sin today. He will. He will render to every man according to his 
deeds. Verse 7. If you, if you live a perfect life, that's what the patient continuing, patiently continuing, patient continuance, patient continuance in well doing, you sing it. If you patiently continue in, in well doing, if you live a perfect life, he'll give you eternal life. He owes it to you. We just read the verse about the work and the reward. Is that a legitimate offer? How do you know? Sort of. Well, it says so, but is there any, outside of the Bible, and you'll be getting my point in a second here, is there any evidence that that's a true statement? How about the Lord Jesus Christ? Our very Savior is evidence that that's a legitimate offer. Now, I don't suggest you rely on that program, <laughs> but it's a legitimate offer. And the world's out there saying, yeah, I'm good enough. I'm good enough. Jesus' blood paid the price because Jesus accomplished what he had to accomplish. And it was enough. God's judgment is according to truth and righteousness. Now, so look back in here in verse 8. But unto them that are contentious, do not obey the truth, but obey in righteousness. Indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, upon every soul of man that do with evil, the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Now we want to be clear here, when the Bible uses the word evil, the Bible does not usually use it the way we use it. In the Bible, evil is usually the opposite of good. Okay, we think of evil as well, there's things that are kind of bad, like speeding, and there's things that are really bad, like lying, and then there are terrible things like child abuse and, and Hitler, and that's evil. And I wouldn't really dispute that, but that's not the way the Bible normally uses the word evil. Evil is the opposite of good. Good is what? What God would do. Okay? And to them that are contentious, do not obey the truth. They, they're obeying something. You see that? They obey in righteousness. Paul was talking about that. They're wrapped up in whatever the religion that they want to be wrapped up in is. Be it what we traditionally call religion or football or Mother Earth or whatever it is. To those people, indignation and wrath from God and tribulation and anguish, that's that means old. Because they know it's coming. Upon every soul of man to do with evil, of the Jew first, and also of the Gentile. Come with me, if you would, to Revelation 20. Let's look at that day of wrath real quick. Revelation 20, verse 11. Death, 
whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's the judgment. You can escape that judgment if you're in Christ. But that's what you have to look, a person has to look forward to if they reject the gospel. If they rely on their own human good to get them to heaven. I pick on this person. I've met the person. I can guess based on the religion she was in how it ended up. Is there anybody that would deny that Mother Teresa did a huge amount of human good? The suffering that she helped alleviate, the physical suffering, but you know what? If she didn't get people saved, if she didn't get herself saved, if she didn't get those other people saved, she made them comfortable until they go to the fire. And I hope I'm wrong based on the religion she was in. Anybody do more human good than that? That's the judgment, though, according to their words. Because they're not in Christ. It's not going to happen like this. But you get to the judgment seat of Christ, and they're already going to know, by the way. And why should we let you in? What'd you do? I didn't do a thing. I just believed. Come on. That doesn't happen that way, okay? But that's the issue. Who you are in Christ. Did you quit relying on your ability and put yourself in? Don't put yourself in Christ. Believe so that God can put you into Christ and just rest in who you've been made in Him. I said God's not imputing sin to the world today. But look at one more thing. Look over at Galatians 3. Galatians 3, and then we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 5. Galatians 3 and verse 10. For as many are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continue with them on, and all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Every single one of them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. The law is not of faith, but the men that do with them shall live with them. Hey, if you do everything, if you, if you do every last one of them, you will live. Verse 13. Praise the Lord. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that way we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Because of what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross, he's redeemed us from the curse of the law, that, that, that need to have to do every single thing in the law. In fact, he's made that exclusionary to him that worketh not the believer. Don't miss that. We talk, we, we, we talk about the believer. To him that worketh not. You can't work. No need of the flesh is going to be acceptable. Okay, come with me to 2 Corinthians 5. This judgment of God, and we talked about the, the riches of his goodness, the forbearance and the long suffering, it should lead, knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repent. That should lead it to repent. God is not imputing sin to the world today. If, if you want to know what it looks like for God to impute sin, go back and look at Ananias and Sapphira and early acts. Mm -hmm. It's a piece of property that they own. They could have done it. They lied. It was a little lie. What even if they lied? Who hasn't lied about property taxes? Come on. <laughs> I mean, really? Bam! That's after the cross, by the way. Yeah. That's after the cross. You want to go back? How about Miriam and Aaron? Moses, you're taking on too much. We want 
We're, we're older than you are. God says, Miriam, you get seven days time out. A little leprosy for you. Yeah. Some other people come along. Say, Moses, you've taken on too much. We're just like you. Moses says, okay. Come see me tomorrow. And if you live to the old age, you're right. But if the earth swallows you up, you know you were wrong. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> the guys come, they show up. What do you got for us, Moses? What happens? You guys familiar? The earth opens up, swallows them alive into the pit. They went into, they went, they went into hell alive. 250 going, whoo, glad we went with them. Zap! <laughs> That's what it looks like for God to impute sin today. God's not doing that. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, old things are all things are become new. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that is, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We're to be out there saying, God is not imputing the sin today. It's a time of long suffering and forbearance and grace and peace. Get saved, otherwise you're going to hell. Paul talked about you show the gospel, you better tell somebody what they're saved from. Not much hope to say, you know, you're going to be saved for your time here on earth. I mean, as I get older and take up more volume, I would appreciate that, but that's not saving, being saved from hell. That, that got my attention. Christianity tell you God is imputing sin to the world today. That's why they miss the simplicity of the gospel. Several years ago, the uh, nightclub in uh, Florida, Pulse nightclub, gay nightclub. I don't know who was there. I'm assuming it was a bunch of 20-something young men, 30-something young men. God will have all men to be saved come to the knowledge of the truth. Everybody gets on the TV. That was God punishing them. God will have all men to be saved. These 30 year old men, he struck down in the prime of their life, took 50 years, 60, 70 years off their life, seven years of an opportunity to get saved. Hmm. That's not impeding sin in the world today. Now, there are other consequences for sin. Yeah. You're on a red light. You've got an appointment with me. Because I have an estimate in your right to car. The best example is that I heard Richard tell about Katrina years ago. Remember Katrina came in? They had the gay, gay, gay convention there in New Orleans a week before. Mm -hmm. Pat Robertson, whoever it was, gets on whatever channel he was on. That's God punishing them. Dead of iniquity, saw them more down there. Richard pointed out, Katrina didn't hit New Orleans, it hit Side Out. Which, by the way, I don't know these things, I know what it is now. And what got New Orleans was the flood. Like Richard likes to say, if God was impeding their sin, he was a week late and he missed. <laughs> but that's the kind of silliness that's out there. It flies in the face of this. God took my son from me because he got wrapped up in drugs. I heard that one said very recently. God's not killing your children to get a hold of anybody's attention. Mm -hmm. These are the, now, understand, it's Christianity, Christendom, that's making these statements. Yeah. It's not the world out there. We get wrapped up a lot in what's going on in the world out there. We need to clean up our own house. Sorry. We're upset about the political situation in the country today. Where have we been for the last 25 years? We could run for office. I'm not telling you to run for office, but I've got better things to do. We could use more Christian leaders in this country, right? God's not imputing sin to the world today, and that's the message we need to be out there declaring. But, if the person rejects that gospel their entire life, what are they doing? Treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath and righteous judgment of God. 
Just because they're not impeding. And I am not saying that everybody is forgiven. And I am not saying that everybody's going, going to heaven. And I am not saying that everybody's sins are forgiven. I think I said that too. I'm not saying that. Okay. You don't know why I'm saying that good for you. <laughs> but they are treasuring up that wrath. Because they're relying on who they are. And we need to take the message that that's not true. It's been said, I'm sure you've heard it said, and we'll be done. The only forgive unforgivable sin today is the sin of unbelief. Who? If you die in unbelief, yeah, you're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. If you have a deathbed conversion, you live 103 years. I have a step grandma. My step grandma, she lived to be 102. If she, she was not a believer. If she had a deathbed conversion, on her own. 30 seconds, one second before she died, and it's not up to me, it's up to God, then you know what? God forgave that. Don't let me come along and tell you the only unforgivable sin today is the sin of unbelief. Because that means the cross can't cover something. And this is a time of long suffering and forbearance where God is not imputing sin in the world today. But the judgment is coming, and the judgment is according to truth and righteousness, and it's going to be based on a person who works. Doesn't matter if they're good or bad. From our viewpoint. Now, if somebody somehow managed to get there and they lived that perfect life, and that's not happen. <laughs> Only one person lived that perfect life, and that's the evidence that is a legitimate offer. It's the evidence that we can't do it. And God sent him as a propitiation, a fully satisfying sacrifice. You go read Isaiah 53, God looked down on the travail of his soul and was satisfied. God thinks. Let me, let me get two more verses. This is kind of trouble here. Look at Ephesians one.
I'll say where, where I should start. If you haven't put your faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, do it now. All you need to do is believe. In the stillness of your heart. God thinks Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day for your justification. Agree with that. Believe that. And then you too. Don't have to worry about being judged according to your works. Your best five seconds. And rest assured that you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. <coughs> forever certain but your eternal security in Christ. Forever looking for that hope in the heavenly places. Forever the beautiful Lord. I guess that's the way it is. <laughs> really tough to have an impacting point. <laughs> yeah. A little train that good is good. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love. We do thank you for your grace. We thank you for the time in which we live, the time we do not impute sin to the world, as a time of grace and peace and long suffering and forbearance, where the riches of your goodness is on display. That it will simply believe what you believe in. Simply believe that Jesus Christ came on the cross was enough to pay our sin debt. To keep us out of hell forever, never again in jeopardy of that. That we can just rest knowing that we have an eternity secured in the heavenly places, escaping that righteous and true judgment. Escaping is maybe the wrong word. Because there was a there's a penalty for sin, it's death. And Jesus died, paid, died that death for us. So that we might receive that free gift of eternal life. We can thank you for that wonderful free gift. We thank you for your love and for your grace. In your son's name, amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll take about 15 minutes or so. And we'll reconvene here. I'm going to turn, we'll turn Facebook off. We'll leave the Zoom room open. You want it off? Yeah, go ahead and turn Facebook off. Finish.